Hello and welcome to the second half of Physics 1A in which we'll be learning about thermal physics and waves. So I'm Associate Professor Liz Anxman and I'll be your lecturer for this part of the course. So we'll be starting with thermal physics. Thermal physics can be a little bit more difficult than mechanics because it's a little bit less intuitive, especially when we're dealing with microscopic properties, which we can't see. We'll also need to use approximations sometimes because we'll need to simplify stuff down into a simpler model so that we can actually apply equations to describe what's going on. So we'll see one of these approximations later in this lecture when we look at the expansion of solids. You'll also find that experiments in this topic are a little bit harder to conduct. But let's jump right in and discuss the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics tells us that if we have three objects, A, B, and C, and object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C, and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then objects A and B must be in thermal equilibrium with each other. So if you like mathematical terminology, you can say that thermal equilibrium is a commutative property. But what is thermal equilibrium? Well, two objects are in thermal equilibrium with each other if when they're placed in thermal contact, so placed next to each other so that there's a possibility of heat to flow between them, then no heat does flow between them. When we have them in thermal contact and no heat is flowing, they are in thermal equilibrium. And two objects which are in thermal equilibrium are said to be at the same temperature. Now, this isn't always as obvious as it seems. Take, for example, this stool here. Sorry, it's slightly hard to see because we do have a black stool and a black background. But the legs of my stool are made from metal. And then it's got a cushion up here, which is leather or fake leather. Now, when I touch the metal, it feels much colder to touch than when I touch the fake leather. If you're sitting on a chair which has a metal part and a cushioned part, have a go at this now. So what is happening here is that the metal is actually a much better conductor of heat than the leather. So we'll be learning about conductivity in a later lecture. But this means that when I touch the metal, it conducts heat away from my hand very quickly. Whereas when I touch the fake leather up the top, the heat is conducted away much more slowly. So this means that it feels to my hand like the metal is colder than the leather. However, these two are at the same temperature because they are both in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the room. This stool has been in the room for a long time and I've only just started touching it now. So both of these have reached thermal equilibrium with the surrounding temperature. Now there's quite a number of physical properties that actually change with the temperature. So one example of this is the volume of a liquid. So let's have a look at an example of this now. What I've got here is a flask with some water with food dye in it and a capillary tube. I'm going to hold on to it with my warm hand. As I'm holding it, I'm transferring heat from my hand to the liquid causing the temperature of the liquid to rise, and this is causing the volume of the liquid to rise. You can see that the liquid is rising up through the capillary tube as its volume increases. Now another physical property that changes with temperature is the dimensions of a solid. As something is heated up, it tends to expand. And we'll be looking at an equation to describe that shortly. 
The pressure of a gas at a constant volume is also dependent upon the temperature. So if you've ever dealt with gas bottles, you'd be aware that you need to be very careful how you store these. Because if they're stored somewhere where the temperature is going to increase, then we can get a very high pressure inside the gas bottle and this can cause them to explode. So we need to be careful that we store these away from anywhere that is likely to catch on fire or reach a really high temperature. Another property that changes with temperature is the volume of a gas at a constant pressure. So a nice example of this is the Earth's atmosphere. If we think about the top of the Earth's atmosphere, then during the day as the gas molecules inside the atmosphere heat up, they travel more quickly and the top of the Earth's atmosphere actually rises. Overnight, the temperature decreases, the gas molecules slow down a little bit, and the top of the Earth's atmosphere becomes closer to the surface of the Earth. So the Earth's atmosphere is actually kept at a constant pressure because the pressure is created by the gravitational force of the Earth on the gas molecules in the atmosphere. We can also get a color change as we change the temperature for some special molecules. So for example, you may have seen little thermometers that you can stick on the side of fish tanks and they change color as the temperature of the water inside the fish tank changes. This is also how mood rings work. So let's consider now how a basic thermometer works. So here I've got a basic thermometer. These have been around for a very long time. So how they work is the tip of the thermometer reaches thermal equilibrium with whatever we're trying to measure. So it can take a little while to reach thermal equilibrium. So for example, if you're using a thermometer to measure the temperature of say your mouth, you may have to wait a minute or two for the tip to reach thermal equilibrium with your mouth. Once it reaches thermal equilibrium or as it approaches thermal equilibrium, the volume of the liquid inside the thermometer contracts or expands depending on if we're getting hotter or we're getting colder. Now, thermometers are, in, in the olden days when they were first created were traditionally calibrated at two temperatures. So they'd be calibrated at zero degrees C and we chose that one because that is the temperature at which ice melts. So it's easy to measure where that is. And they'd also be calibrated at 100 degrees C, which is the temperature at which water boils, at least at atmospheric pressures. And so when thermometers were being created, we'd mark on zero degrees C, we'd mark on 100 degrees C, and then we'd section off 100 little evenly spaced sections between those. And this gives us a nice way to measure temperature. So this brings us to temperature scales. There's three temperature scales in common usage, Celsius, Kelvin, and Fahrenheit. So Celsius is probably what you're most familiar with. As we've just said, zero degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure is the temperature at which ice melts. 100 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure is the temperature at which water boils. Now Kelvin is a really useful temperature scale. Zero Kelvin is also known as absolute zero, and in classical physics, this is the temperature at which all motion ceases. So we get some pretty cool physics happening there. So for example, we can get Bose-Einstein condensates for it, forming, which you'll learn about in higher year physics courses if you go on with physics. We can't have any temperatures below zero Kelvins. So there is an absolute limit on the cold end of our temperature scale. We can have temperatures ever increasing. However, at some point, all matter is going to break apart because there'll just be too much energy involved. It's fairly easy to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. A change of 10 degrees Celsius is the same as a temperature change of 10 Kelvins. So to convert from Celsius to Kelvins, we need to add 273. So for example, zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273 Kelvins, and 100 degrees Celsius is equal to 373 Kelvins. 
Now Fahrenheit we won't be using in this course, though it is commonly used in some places in the world such as America. So the Fahrenheit scale is named after the German physicist Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit and the story goes that he defined 100 degrees Fahrenheit as the temperature underneath his wife's armpit or body temperature. So we can convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius using the equation that the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32 all times 5 and divided by 9 gives us the temperature in Celsius that you won't ex be expected to use this equation during this course. So the most common temperature scale that we'll be using in this course is Kelvin's. So you do need to be able to convert temperatures from Celsius to Kelvin. Now before we go on, it's useful to have a picture in your mind of what gases, liquids and solids look like. Now I'm aware that you probably learned about these in primary school, but just before going on, jot down your definition of a gas, a liquid and a solid. 